Hello again, my friends. I must say, I was very surprised by the response to part one of the series. I am uh, very uh, pleased by your comments, and at the end of this video, I will uh, talk. I will talk about your comments. So, we jump back in with the Asuka period. This is 540 to 700 AD. This was the rapid colonization, the spread of Buddhism through Japan. The Buddhist Soga clan was very powerful at this time. They were puppeting the Japanese central government in the 580s. Fujiwara clan, a very powerful warrior clan, comes along and sorts out the fat boys. Prince Shotoku, regent of the Asuka period, he was a dummy thick. I always find it funny in Buddhism the monks were always so scrawny, but the Buddha so fat. There is some symbolism here, I am sure. Then, from 600 to 1000 AD, uh, this part uh, may be a little bit boring, but uh, I must give chronology of this period of uh, when and what is uh, going on to uh, introduce uh, Japan from China. So in 600s, a legal code called Ritsuryo was adopted to start modeling a new Japanese state and cultural forms based on centralized China model. They wanted to get away from this tribal kind of a shaman thing that they had going. They knew it was not very crash hot. It was very primitive. From what I have read, this uh, new system was based uh, basically on the Chinese Book of Rights, uh, dated around 300 or 500 BC. And from this, we can see how advanced the China was in their rule and legal code compared to other civilizations, definitely competing with the ancient Greek in 500 BC. Also, Confucius around 500 BC or so, this was definitely a golden age of philosophy and a bureaucratic rule for China. Then, in 700s AD, a guy named Tenmu, probably emperor, wanted to build a mythical legend about a Yamato ruling dynasty that they descend from the sun goddess Amaterasu. So he take the unwritten Shinto mythology that was the culture thing at the time and blend in the royal family to make Kojiki texts. But he excluded any reference of Big Fat Man Buddha, though, because he wanted uniquely Japanese mythology. But uh, he jumped the gun a little bit here. It did not catch on so well. Why did the Japanese uh, peasants need what they already had? But uh, here we see beginning of divergence from China culture and emergence of a Japanese culture. That is the sentiment of the rulers to do so, but they were not quite ready. A few years later, a revision of Kojiki, written called the Nihon Shoki, which slap on some Buddhism to the Shinto Kami stuff, and this was much better received than the original Kojiki. Buddhism, like rice, was very well received in Japan. So we move forward a little bit to the Nara period, with Empress Genmei, basically the century of 700 only. Short period, this Nara. Genmei, she was a beautiful girl princess. I know this because I saw it in an anime show. Yes, absolutely gorgeous. Blonde hair, everything. But otherwise, the 700s uh, sucked hard. Lots of natural disasters, a smallpox epidemic that killed maybe half the population in some areas. But Japan was modernizing, building roads, introducing of first coinage, doing more economics activities, doing the GDP and Buddhism still growing as a religious faction, competing with military clan like Fujiwara. Later in 1500s, there will be a big showdown with military monks, Iko Iki, and the samurai class. As time go on, military clans like Fujiwara hold the true power, but they still allow Yamato family aristocracy to rule, so to speak. Interesting, they do not try to replace imperial family. Yamato is kind of sacred, as a rule of thumb. Military leave imperial family alone, let them have nominal power. But, of course, real power lies with military, like always. Military clans contributed to royal bloodline by giving daughters, beautiful, gorgeous daughters, as princesses for intermarriage. This word, shown Chinese in origin, uh, meaning manor or state, was also how uh, Fujiwara gradually gained resource and manpower. The Taiho Code of 720 AD was more or less legal code of morals and governments taken from China Confucianism and Tang rule. It 
was actually like separation of church and state. Department of Watership handle cultural and religious ceremony, and Department of State handle secular matters of state. But unlike Tang model, Taiho Code in Japan was based on birthright, blood, not merit. They also ignore famous mandate of heaven. This one is in Sun Tzu, uh, War of... Uh, uh, what is this one called? Uh, the Art of War, yes, yes, the Art of War. This is where a ruler is permitted by gods to rule because he is wise and virtuous. A ruler does not need to be of noble birth. But instead, Japanese assert a deterministic perspective that, that might... <coughs> oh, the, oh, my throat. Ah, I am dry. I must have a little beer here. Instead, Japanese assert deterministic perspective that the right to rule originates from imperial descent, not from righteousness and virtuous ruler. This surprised me a little, actually, and give credit to Chinese. Meritocracy is good for rule, to exclude the retards from imperial power. By 800s, Japan enters Heian period. Here, Buddhism and Shinto Kami being equally practiced in Nippon society at this stage, and the capital is moved to Heian Kyo. You might think this one sounds familiar. Yes, also known as Kyoto. Haiyan Imperial Capital was styled on Chinese Tang Capital at Chang'an. You ever wonder why Japanese and Chinese architecture look similar? Now you know why. Around the same time, China having little problem, you see, called Huang Chao Rebellion, which weakened the Tang Dynasty and Japan suspended emissaries to China. It also looked very bad. Loss of face for China in Japan's eyes, Japanese started losing respect. So, Chinese influence declined as Japan realized they want their own stuff. Thank you, China, now back you go. Huang Chao. This would make a good name for a Chinese noodle dish, like uh, Kung Pao chicken. Actually good when you go to a decent Chinese restaurant, you know, quite spicy with the Sichuan pepper. Japan had been growing, using a centralized model of governance similar to China. And this is okay until you get incompetent emperor and rulers. Then you are all on the same boat, and the boat goes down together. But around 900 to 1000 AD, Japan's central leadership weaken, and areas outside Kyoto capital become more decentralized, more stratified, moving away from the Chinese model of centralization established in the 600s during the Taika reform. It was these last centuries of the first millennium AD that the Japanese started to make samurai, I want to point out also, samurai were simply warrior class. Just because the name samurai does not mean katana. Samurai of feudal Japan commonly fight on horseback, using bow, and for closer quarters using a naijonata, spear halberd type thing, and only during close close quarters, then a likely katana. If you watch the anime, you might think the samurai had light speed agility, dodge arrow barrage, and beat the ten guys all at once, but this is not true. Rule of thumb for pre-firearm warfare, always best to kill from a distance. Emperor Camus, sponsored by the Fujiwaras, continued fighting against the Amishi peoples of northern and eastern Japan. He then granted first title of Shogun to the man who had defeated these people in the north of main island Japan known as Honshu. But who are the Amishi? I tell you now, this word means shrimp barbarian. So early Japanese Yayoi state of 700s was still fighting the Ainu people. Maybe this was like fighting insurgency. The records in general are not good, even worse for filthy gaijin like me trying to find an English. Side note, Kamu was busy man. He had over 20 wives and 32 children. He was living harem anime lifestyle, but in real life. I noticed in the animes, uh, best girl, always blonde hair with blue eyes or green. I think this best combination, I appreciate the Japanese taste for blonde, even though blonde not indigenous in Japan. I think in future, when the pesky American empire collapse, Japan can start eugenic program for making blonde cat girl with color eyes and double eyelid. I think this possible, yes. With a new genes for uh, double eyelid, maybe uh, abduct some uh, German or Norwegian girl for blonde hair and eyes and a little pinch of finest, prettiest yayoi to give Asian twist in there. It could be fun, you know. Talking about Fujiwara, starting 800, Fujiwara dominated the government of Japan, and warrior class in general was increasing in power. This hardly surprising, they control the military. 
the divine status of emperor, I think make a gulf of separation between him and army, allowing for a warlord to hold real power in the form of armed forces. But Fujiwara also presided over a period of great cultural and artistic propensity in court and aristocracy, this time important for Japanese literature. Japanese in autistic genius take Chinese characters and simplify into phonetic Japanese script of katana. No, no, uh, katakana. Easy mistake there, I think. Katakana then abbreviated to hiragana, type of cursive syllabary with distinct writing methods making it uniquely Japanese. Supposedly caught women, not trained in Chinese like male associates, helped to make hiragana uniquely a Japanese. One second, let me let me rehydrate here with nutritious fermented beverage. So, Fujiwara was top dog until Hogan Rebellion of 1156, which was basically imperial secession dispute between Fujiwara and Minamoto slash Taira warrior clan. Emperor Shirakawa and Sutoko had both abdicated. New Emperor Kono had ascended the throne, but then, very disappointingly, he let the team down, he died. Q secession dispute. Fujiwara support was largely for Sotoku, who lost the battle, but Fujiwara had finger in both pies, you see. Different Fujiwara sons were on both sides, so this allowed Fujiwara family members to continue in bureaucracy, but gradually replaced as time went on. But regardless, Fujiwara regency ended and replaced by Minamoto, with Fujiwara went Taiho Code, marking formal decentralization of rule and general independence of states outside of Kyoto in 1200. Then, basically, 1200, 1100 to 1200, sorry, continuous civil war in Japan. During high-end period, many little baby Nipponese being produced and harvests were good, but end of high-end period, around 1200, harvest yield declined and conflict for land and resources intensified as greater population put demand on the rice fields. After Hogan Rebellion, there is conflict between two victorious clans. In 1160, we have New Rebellion, we have Hogan Part 2, this one called Heiji Rebellion, between Taira and Minamoto. Taira actually win this one, but they become too busy getting tip wet in imperial court with gorgeous Japanese nubile women, and neglect actual rule of Japan, so Minamoto allowed to rebuild in strength. But Minamoto come back hard in Genpei War, defeating Taira and creating Kamakura Shogunate and Kamakura period from 1185 to 1333. With Minamoto, we can safely say Japan entered feudal era and could now make samurai en masse at castles, just like in the Age of Empires game, you would have played this, yes. But now there is a big change. First time ever, Japan is invaded. Mongol invasions in Japan in 1274 and 1281 under Kublai Khan, Buddhist Mongol shaman warlord of Yuan dynasty. Japan had broken off diplomatic relations after Huang Chao rebellion in 800s AD, and had never bothered to send a Christmas card to old friends. In 1268, Kublai demanded tribute from Japan. Shogunate say no. Fuck off! Haha! <laughs> now, must build many walls. The first invasion in 1274, they landed Tsushima, this uh, island between Korea and Kyushu. Then onward to Kyushu, land of the Japanese pirates, or soon to be land of the Japanese pirates, after they get good idea from the Yuan. Yuan Mughal pirates land in Hakata Bay on morning of 19 December 1274. But stiff defense by Japan and difficult landing terrain make landing hard. But by evening, the pirates, by sheer number, had forced Japanese off the beaches and moved inland. To rest for the night, Yuan commanders call back their forces to be ready for morning assault. The Japanese waited, and morning came. But the Japanese saw no one. In fact, divine wind, kamikaze, struck Yuan fleet and dashed them upon the rocks. Others were blown back to Korea by strong winds. This was also first time gunpowder hand grenades were used in battle by Mongols to great effect. Japanese reports say thunderous explosions and fire scared Japanese and terrified horses, making good gains for Mongols. But of the several hundred ships, maybe 200 were lost, and half the original 30,000 estimated Yuan force did not refer to Chaya. 
So better luck next time. Kublai thought so. This time he would not half ass it. Maybe as many as 1,000 or 1,500 ships and 120,000 soldiers amassed in Korea and China. Again they hit Tsushima and fuck it up. They take women, strip their naked and drive stakes through hands and feet onto side of Mongol ships as warning if Japanese did not surrender. But the Mongols, they miscalculate. The Japanese were not Chinese peasants. They did not quiver in their boots quite so easily. This was not something that the Japanese did not already do to themselves, of course. The tales of Japanese brutality to each other are not hyperbole. By the way, after battles of rivals in Japan, some shogun do head-viewing ceremony, where they sip the sake in the tent and have the heads of the defeated paraded in front of them, where they can inspect them. As side note, I am unsure where Japanese brutality come from. I do not think European warriors or barbarians were quite as brutal towards civilians, but this is hard to verify. Maybe I am wrong. But back to the Mongols. The second time around, they land at Hakata Bay and Kyushu again, but this time Japanese were prepared. They had built stone walls on the beaches and put many stakes into the ground, into the sands, into the beach. Many archers blotted out the sun as the Mongols attempted to advance. They succeeded in driving off the invasion force and the Yuan retreated to their ship's anchor. But the Battle of Kowan, as it became known, continued for weeks from June to August, resulting in a stalemate. Key point about the Yuan fleet, you see many of the ships, they were hastily requisitioned by Kublai Khan, and they were flat-bottomed river boats. They did not handle the stormy straits of Japan very well. On the 15th of August, divine wind again, kamikaze! Strike them. Yuan attempts to anchor in nearby bays did not help, and the fleet was devastated. Thousands of soldiers drowned or were left clinging to flotsam like noodle in the pool. The Japanese systematically round up all invaders that were floating and executed, except southern Chinese who they made into slaves. According to Samson, this was because the Japanese did not think southern Chinese were there by volunteering. Or maybe they just needed some labor of some peasants who could not fight very well, who knows. The Mongols did not attempt another invasion after the second failure. They could not. All the lumber in Korea had been cut down and naval shipbuilding ability in Korea had been crippled by the shortage. But while Japan had repelled nasty noodle pirates, there was no new land to reward gallant defenders with. Plus, government coffers had been depleted by the pre-war constructions, and no compensation was in sight. This undermined Kamakura shogunate authority. So the Japanese defenders turned the tables. Many became pirates to raid Korea and China, but also there was much discord in China at this time. More on this later. I believe the repulsion of the Mongol invasions was critical juncture in Japanese history. I do not think Mongol victory would have meant much, however. This is not why I say it is critical. In less than a century, Yuan dynasty collapsed from infighting. I strongly doubt that China could have maintained occupation of deadly, restless, eternally angry Japanese. I think by 1200s, Japanese martial culture was enshrined to a point rivaling that of the Spartan Greek. They loved to fight. They would commit seppuku at the first given opportunity. But unlike Spartan Greek, they were producing enough baby samurai to maintain warrior class. Actually, this was a big problem for Sparta, by the way. After the Peloponnesian War, in the late 300s BC, where they all decide to fight the Greek states. They actually did very well in this, by the way, but they lose too many men, and this caused Spartan decline. Nietzsche argued that the rise of philosophers in the latter period of ancient Greece was indicative of declining civilization. Maybe Japanese did not appreciate philosophers so much. I have not fully researched Japanese philosophy myself. But maybe this prevented the nihilistic overanalysis of society that leads to laconic apathy and loss of interest for men and women in making more baby. Or possibly it was overabundance of comforts and resources in later period of ancient Greece that caused a bubble and squeaks away from patriotic sex stores and into degenerate nihilistic hedonism. But back to the impact of the failed Mongol invasion, this was a time of great flux. In this time, as soldier or samurai, you expect to be rewarded when you win fight that you risk your life, and this is reasonable, yes. But there was no reward. 
Suddenly samurai become like ronin almost. The emperor they serve was not able to pay their salary, so they look to other means of making warfare and making booty and plunder. Cue the emergence of the Kyushu pirates. From 1250 onwards, agriculture output increased due to new knowledge of fertilizer and irrigation technique, use of iron tools and double cropping. Famines and epidemics decreased, and Buddhism, before only for nobles, start to spread to peasants in Nichiren Buddhism form. Samurai started to adopt Zen Buddhism en masse, but by this point, the samurai decided it was time for a change of leadership and rallied around Emperor Daigogogogo to dethrone Kamakura Shogunate in 1331. This worked, but then he tried to consolidate power around imperial rule and revert to civilian government instead of de facto military government that had been in place last 150 years in Kenu Restoration of 1333. Samurai recognized what was going on, they were not stupid, you see, and he was exiled to the Okidoki Doki Islands soon after. So with Daigogo having Gogo into exile, Ashikaga Takuji took over and this was the first shogun of the Murumachi era. According to Zen master Soseki, Ashikaga, he was cool guy, you see, very Zen, mandate of heaven, all this. There as some uh, other stuff going on as well, like division of imperial court into north and south court with separate emperors, but Ashikaga put an end to the circus, choosing north emperor to be only emperor. Shugo lords, like regional military constables, began to emerge, a far cry from earlier times of centralized power. Over time, Shugo grow into daimyo, who become vassal of shogun. I find different words for these uh, feudal lords very confusing, uh, by the way. Same in English with uh, Baron, Lord, uh, Count, uh, Baroness, uh, whatever. But uh, regardless, uh, they had some soldiers, so their vote mattered, you see. Japanese soldiers had taken lessons from the Yuan invasions and decided to become the swashbuckling pirates. After Kublai Khan died in 1294, the Yuan dynasty became soft, it fell apart, and the Ming dynasty take over in 1368. This was great time for pirate raiding all along Korea and China. The Ming Dynasty reached out and tried to re-establish relation to help stop the raids. But to little result, Yoshi Mitsun, next in line from Ashikaga, say okay, this good. And Japan trade minerals and excellence sword Japanese katana cut through tank in China for silk and fine goods. Zen Buddhism, Shinto and Confucianism all see renewed interest in Muromachi period as well. But before we move into the famous Sengoku period, or Warring State period, we should take a quick detour to talk about the pirates. It was in the 1300s that Japanese pirates, or Waiko, became notorious in Korea and China. I used to wonder about this anime, uh, this one called uh, One Piece, with Japanese pirates going on adventures. I never watch it because the animation makes me want to claw my eyes out, but I hear it is very popular. Now I know why this anime is thing in Japan. Conquest of the Wacko Pirates, it is not just fantasy, it is real. So, three things bring these Wacko about. The ignition of idea of raiding in the conscious of the Japanese warrior class from repelled Mongol invasion. Uh, the decision to banning foreign trade by Ming Dynasty, this very, very poor decision, by the way. Weakness of uh, central power and public order in Japan after invasion. Uh, like I said, uh, Samurai were very upset with both Emperor and Chinese that no booty after the beatback of the noodle pirates, so they decide to go and liberate booty themselves from their invaders. Also, Aryan-type vigor and power of the Samurai warrior spirit and commercial interest that Japanese society had generated after centuries of stimulating civil war and growing trade. You know, I find this, this interesting. You know, Normally, the civil war is something that weakens countries, but in Japan it only made them grow. Made them stronger. Yeah, these guys are nuts, huh? The final point is actually very important. It was not simply desire to trade that spurred on piracy. It was also necessity. Japan was growing fast in population and prosperity and needed cheap Chinese toys. I mean foreign commodities to continue this growth. As I said in the past video, the resource situation in Japan is quite poor. And this is also one of the main reasons they extended out into China, Manchuria, and Southeast Asia during World War II, which uh, prompted America to sanction them. But this is a, this is a very this is very long story. This one, uh, I, I maybe I will touch on this one in later video. 
So, under the Ashikaga Yoshimitsu rule, the shogun, uh, he was uh, he was quite good, you know. He ruled from 1370 to 1410. He was able to restrain the Wako pirates. He was able to keep order. His concern was retaliation invasion by Chinese, but I think also disruption in trade that these pirates were causing. But after Ashikaga died, the pirates get back to it with renewed vigor. Political order deteriorated into secession dispute of Onan War in 1470, but more on this later. But you see, the pirate uh, was not just about trading, looting, and uh, pillage. Because Chinese coastal population could not trade by imperial Ming decree, there was illicit bootlegging and pirate trade for anything Japanese in demand. By 1300, centuries of fighting had perfected Japanese swordcraft into legendary status. Side note on Japanese metallurgy, by the way, Japanese iron ore, known as uh, mocha tetsu, because it looked like a black uh, mochi cake, very high in iron content and very low in sulfur and phosphorus. These two, uh, sulfur and phosphorus, they uh, make the iron, uh, they make it weak, they make it uh, brittle. So this ore, it was uh, great for making swords, just as good as Swedish ores, which uh, I think were quite uh, legendary in uh, in the 20th century. I think still today, the Swedish uh, steel ores, uh, Swedish steel is very good. It is thrown around sometimes when you shop for uh, boutique uh, kitchen knives. You know, uh, you get the uh, Japanese steel kitchen knife and then you see the uh, Swedish steel kitchen knife as well. This one usually stainless. We also see first glimpses of uh, future Toyota Corporation steel metallurgy perfection that cheap Chinese steel could not compete. The uh, Nippon swordsmiths perfected the furnaces, tempering and metallurgy treatments of the steel that distinguished their swords from many others. This is a very interesting topic, actually. Uh, I would uh, I would like to talk more on this uh, about these uh, these methods that they they perfected. Uh, I read that uh, the the Chinese uh, swordsmiths they had been building a somewhat uh, composite blade. They would use a soft ductile iron core, and they would uh, uh, how you say forge weld harder uh, surfaces above that to make the cutting edge, and this would make a flexible and durable sword. But uh, the Japanese swordsmiths, you see, they, they perfected this process. They uh, perfected the, uh, the uh, f uh, folding 1,000 times. You know how they say uh, when they first start, you know, with this, uh, with this iron billet, this uh, impure billet. Uh, they keep uh, folding it and beating it, and this beats out the impurities. Uh, supposedly, uh, this billet, if it lose up to 90% of its weight uh, after this process, but the sword was incredibly... Uh, high purity uh, carbon steel which is excellent for maintaining a keen edge these uh, swordsmiths they also perfected the furnaces uh, these uh, tempering and metallurgy treatments of the steel that distinguished the swords from many others i read something about they were using special clay with uh, olivine this olivine clay uh, this this olivine is i think a silicate mineral it contains high level of uh, iron and uh, that uh, the temperatures that they were forging the steel, this uh, olivine in the clay, it would uh, liquefy on the uh, surface of the steel and form as like flux to draw out impurities. Uh, so this is a very interesting topic, but uh, uh, back to the pirates. Uh, by 1500s, Kyushu was basically like Bahamas of the East Asia, a pirate haven. Think pirates of Caribbean, except Jack Sparrow with uh, the Chinese eyes, yes. The uh, Koreans tried to stop the raids, they signed formal agreements for trade, but the Ming refused, so the raids continued. Some of these pirates were joined by Korean renegades and Chinese expatriates, and as time went on, they even established colonies in Southeast Asia. I think I read uh, somewhere uh, that there was a colony in uh, uh, Vietnam and uh, possibly Cambodia, these pirates... Uh, there was some uh, Japanese uh, that had uh, gone very far inland, but uh, I, I have not read this in a long time. Uh, I do not know where I read either. But uh, with piracy and trade came the Portuguese and European culture and technologies, but uh, more on this later. So going back to the, uh, the Japanese history. Around 1480, regional daimyo were ruling completely independent of shogun, which had lost most power. Much infighting and civil war throughout the end of the 1400s and into the 1500s, rise of the ninja. Much 
subterfuge and spying at this time. Also, with the poor central government, very good time for Western foray into Japan. In 1543, trading ship blow, of course, from China and land on Tanagashima, island near Kyushu. And with this ship came Portuguese traders, and with the Portuguese traders came the musket. Yes, guns, very good. This new technology is excellent, yes. In 1550, Jesuits also arrive. Francis Xavier, this guy, he arrived on Kyushu Island. So while rulers fighting throughout the 1500s, Portuguese are expanding very nicely. The Portuguese Empire at this time was expanding very good. They had uh, Brazil and I think a few other places, yes. Uh, and uh, with the Portuguese came the, uh, the Catholics, the Pope, as well. Then in 1571, Dom Bartolomeu, also known as Omura Sumitada, gave little village of Nagasaki to the Portuguese. Yes, you heard right, it does sound a lot like Nagasaki, first Portuguese colony in Japan. But regardless of war, Japan was doing very good in economic prosperity. Like I said, they seem to thrive on this war, it stimulates them as though uh, you are jumping into cold bath. It wakes you up. From 1390 to 1450, the Japanese population increase from 6 to 10 million. This is quite a large doubling in only 60 years. Commerce was doing very well, and the merchant man was very happy. Wide-scale minting of coins for everyday use in Japan emerged, and Japan shift from butter to currency economy. I had to say a uh, note about the coins. Uh, the coins were in use earlier, but uh, they were, how you say, they were uh, not suitable for uh, wide-scale circulation. Uh, I do not know exactly why this is. Maybe they were made out of gold and uh, the, the peasants could not afford to have a single gold coin. But I believe uh, when this wide-scale minting occurred, they were made from, uh, say, copper, and they were uh, minted uh, quite well, uh, uniformly, uh, not just uh, stamped with a hammer. Uh, so the Asikaga shogun at this time, uh, Yoshimasa, was a bad politician and military leader. He really was. But uh, that said, he played a critical role in cultural development, and for this, I think uh, we owe Yoshimasa a lot. Things like Ikebana flower arrangement art. Uh, yes, uh, same with this uh, bonsai, this little baby tree that they grow. Uh, Japanese gardening. Uh, also, uh, the funny uh, Japanese no. That is not uh, no, but uh, N O H. This uh, no theater and uh, this uh, very quaint little uh, tea ceremony. This one became popular in the 1400s. So, returning again to Sansom Book. The recurrent civil wars before 1600 were all, in essence, struggles for the possession of good rice lands, and feudal society was based primarily upon the conditions of the tenure of those lands. Though other grain crops, mostly unirrigated, such as barley, wheat, and millet, together with vegetables, mulberry, and tea, are grown in fair quantities in soil unsuited for wet rice culture, rice has always dominated the agrarian society of Japan. This has been mainly a matter of tradition, for rice has always been the preferred diet of the Japanese people, who do not willingly eat other cereals. I find this, this to be quite interesting, because you will actually, uh, you will see a, a, a wheat a feature in Japanese cuisine. In fact, I would even argue that this wheat uh, features more in Japanese cuisine than it does in the Southern Chinese and Southeast Asian cuisines, especially Southeast Asia. And this is because the climate of Southeast Asia, and I think also uh, Southern China, uh, is too uh, wet and humid for uh, wheat. You see, wheat uh, is susceptible to uh, a fungus. One of these fungus is called ergot. And uh, this ergot is a toxic, uh, psychedelic uh, fungus that grows from the ear of the wheat. It looks like a little uh, rat turd, and they grow out from the wheat. They parasitize the wheat kernel. And if your rice becomes contaminated with this ergot, uh, not only is it a toxic, but it will, uh, it will cause uh, terrible uh, psychedelic uh, uh, hallucinations, uh, psychosis. It is, uh, this is one of the explanations of the Salem witch trials, that their wheat had been contaminated to some extent by this uh, ergot, and they thought that these women were, were witches, but, uh, you know, who knows, uh, they might have just been witches, they might have been casting spells and had the black cat. 
you know, who knows? But uh, what I do know is this ergot it is, uh, it is very toxic. Uh, coincidentally, also, the ergot is the precursor for the psychedelic LSD, which is uh, goes through a complex chemical uh, uh, reaction, very complex reaction, this one, uh, to make this uh, psychedelic they put on the paper that the hippie, the trippy hippies quite like. Uh, but uh, yes, uh, so back to the cereal. Uh, I think uh, in northern Japan, where the climate is too cold and too dry for the rice, they have more wheat. But uh, I think typically the cuisine is determined by the climate. And if it is uh, warm and humid, then it is not suitable to grow wheat. I think now we are approaching the 40-minute uh, mark, and I will take some time uh, to address the interesting comments I had from part one of the uh, the this, this series. Uh just for a note, uh, part three will be about Sengoku uh, with Odo Nobunaga. This man is a favorite of mine. He's very cool. Very, very cool guy. Uh, yes, but uh, that will be for the next part. So I will address these, uh, these comments. Uh, I will address them now. Starting with Gojo Burt. Uh, yes, I do appreciate the, your words. Uh, that is strange zeitgeist in Western nation right now to paint all cultures and people as the same. I think this uh, devalues the achievements, the unique achievements of all these different uh, civilizations and cultures, actually. Uh, even to discuss uh, these differences, uh, you can be called racist uh, if you happen to be hanging out with uh, losers. But uh, several uh, time I'm talking with people who are not of the same race as native people in country, and uh, I like to know their origin. You know, they, they some have a very interesting story. Uh, I've heard stories like uh, parents were traders or high achiever and leave a regional country. Uh, say, uh, Lebanese who are living in uh, South and Central America. Uh, they, uh, they, they leave Lebanon, say, uh, during the uh, outbreak of a uh, civil war or, or possibly uh, during turmoil of World War I or World War II uh, to go to Brazil. And uh, they become very successful there. Um, you know, when you ask people, uh, when you ask them questions about their heritage and they get offended, um, you can be sure that, uh, A, they do not know about their heritage and, uh, B, uh, they are not worth your time. So uh, do not ever apologize for asking uh, questions like this. Uh, if I offend, uh, I do not really care. I am a bodgy builder, and uh, I am boxing as well. Where I am now uh, is getting cold, actually, and I like to walk around in shorts, t-shirts, and jandal to dominate space. You know, this mildly unsettling to coddled people who wear a big jacket when temperature is balmy 6 degrees Celsius. <coughs> oh, my friends, I'm sorry. No. Too many beers, yes. Uh, yes, uh, Damien, uh, this is very interesting. I, I like this uh, fun fact. Uh, I Google this about the beer and the hops uh, and cannabis, and I get something interesting. Uh, it turns out uh, de uh, hops uh, uh, and the uh, devil's lettuce both produce terpene and terpenoids, but uh, hops do not have this uh, cellular enzyme to convert this cannabinogolic acid uh, to uh, THC or uh, CBD. Uh, by the way, one of my background is bro bioprocess engineer. I was about to say bro process, but uh, yes, a bioprocess engineer. This is why my writing style normally only good for making engineering report. Uh, next, uh, Gordon. Uh, yes, you are right. Uh, alphabet come from China. Uh, I think I explained in this video earlier on. Uh, but I think uh, China technology progression was good up to maybe the 1500s, like you say, but they did not respect other civilization, uh, especially Europe, thinking they were still doing a mud hut, a uh, caveman like uh, in Neolithic. Uh, I think Marco Polo uh, was first European uh, to properly explore uh, the China. I read somewhere that when he arrived, imperial court provided a translator who could speak Latin because they still believe that Latin was a dominant language in Europe. Maybe this from Byzantium or even Roman contact suggests uh, last proper contact with Europe maybe in 1st millennium AD or before. But uh, trade is essential for technology advancement. And uh, you see, uh, geographically speaking, uh, Africa formed barrier to trade with Europe and Asia until the Horn was circumnavigated. Uh, so uh, it was difficult for uh, for uh, the Europeans uh, to actually get over to China. Uh, it was it was quite difficult. I think it required overland route, and then you had to get the ship. So it was a long hike. Uh, 
that has since been uh, fixed with the uh, Suez Canal, but this was uh, built in, I think, 1870. China, uh, however, was uh, first in, uh, in quite a few things, uh, I think, because of their organization, the centralization uh, in, in, the, uh, in the last millennium uh, BC. And uh, yes, into uh, the first half of the first millennium AD. Uh, obviously, many things copy paste from China uh, to Japan until maybe 800, uh, when influence began to decline. Uh, next question: uh, State of survival. Hmm, uh, this is a pay-to-win game, no? I think I used to see ads about this with the uh, with the zombies. But uh, yeah, yes, the legends. Yes, I already read about history, uh, ancient religious ideas, uh, book one. Uh, this one, uh, this one had the uh, Levant, uh, Middle East, Mesopotamia. I think also discussion of Paleolithic and Neolithic uh, megaliths. You know these Stonehenge type things. They are uh, all over uh, the world. Uh, you know they look like stone tables. I think in some places. And this, uh, these stone tables, they are in India, Korea. Uh, many different places, uh, which lends credence to the possibility of uh, maybe um, a some kind of single origin, or maybe something even deeper. I think Carl Jung uh, discussed something called uh, Carl Jung. Uh, he was a famous uh, Swiss psychologist, but he discussed something a bit esoteric called the collective unconscious. This, uh, this this idea that uh, all members of humanity have some concept of a, a higher divinity, and that is why religions have similarity that are uh, geographically separated. Like when you compare the, uh, the South Americans uh, to uh, the, the ancient uh, Europeans, you will, you will see some similarity, I think, um, in, their, in their very early uh, Neolithic type uh, religions. Uh, but uh, yes, uh, so this this book, uh, Ancient Religious Ideas, um, is from uh, 1980s. But as I was reading it, I was digging into the uh, archaeological finds uh, uh, that had uh, substantiated what was being said in the book. And interestingly enough, there had not been a lot of archaeological finds since that uh, changed the history books, so to speak, when it came to religious ideas. Uh, this book also revealed something else um, uh, very important about uh, these civilizations that are, say, older than, than, uh, than the ancient Greeks. Uh, uh, the question is, did, they, did you write it down, bro? Did you write down your belief system and your history? Uh, uh, did you put them in a safe spot so uh, not get used as building material or burned in the fire? No, um, well, then they did not happen. It is hard to research religious ideas when no surviving text, or hard to read, like uh, for Sumerian cuneiform and ancient Greek Mycenaean linear script A and B. Uh, side note, uh, Mycenaean linear A and Cretan hieroglyphic, both which uh, undeciphered to this day, uh, these were from the, uh, from the Greeks, I think, between 1500 and 1000 BC. Um, not a lot. Uh, this is before uh, the time of the classical Greek period that we all know with uh, Sparta and uh, Athens and all these people. Uh, uh, something else, you know, this is Rosetta Stone. Um, Rosetta Stone was only discovered by chance by Napoleon's force. Uh, I think uh, there was a captain who saw that this, uh, it, was, it was in the walls. Of this fort, they were rebuilding for defense. They, they this, this, uh, this, uh, uh, this stone that is beyond any kind of uh, price. Its value allowed the deciphering of uh, the hieroglyphics. It was simply used as a piece of building material for a wall. Uh, you know, this is what happens when uh, these uh, priceless artifacts fall into the hands of uh, illiterate peasants. Uh, yes, but I think I think that is. Uh, uh, Oh no, I have one more comment. Yes, uh, I know little about the, uh, the the Japanese and also Chinese uh, Asian myth and legends. Uh, unfortunately, state of survival. I have not read this. I have very long reading list, and um, I, you know, I do not spend all day reading. I unfortunately I have to work a normal job. I am not a tenured professor at university. Um, but uh, speaking about the Japanese legend, um, if you are interested in this, I would recommend that you play uh, Sekiro. This uh, game where you play as uh, Ronin, uh, Shinobi, uh, samurai type guy. Uh, this is a good game with uh, many Japanese and Buddhist mythology. Many uh, terrifying uh, monsters in this game. 
these monsters uh, like uh, the how you say the opposite to the uh, Grecian uh, Minotaur and Labyrinth, um, but uh, kind of like with Japanese flavor. It's good, you know. But uh, this legend of uh, immortality, uh, you know, it is the nectar of the gods about adventure to strange foreign alien land to find special flower to bring long life fountain of youth this incredible legend also very very similar uh, to read from wiki about the fountain of youth uh, tales of such a fountain have been recounted around the world for thousands of years appearing in the writings of herodotus uh, 5th century BC, uh, also in the Alexander Romance, uh, 3rd century AD, and in the stories of Prester John of the early Crusades, which I think uh, 1100 or so AD. Uh, stories of uh, similar waters also featured prominently among the people of the Caribbean during the Age of Exploration in the early 1500s. They spoke of the restorative powers of the water in the mythical land of Bimini. Uh, this uh, this is all very uh, inspiring you know these legends they they get the imagination going uh they they are fascinating um uh, also in the story of the epic of gilgamesh this one uh, ancient mesopotamian story very good i highly recommend reading uh but uh, gilgamesh uh, and enkidu i think this uh, gilgamesh is tyrannical uh, leader and uh, he is uh, of of uh, somewhere in mesopotamia and uh, he is brutalizing the population because he is bored and the people pray, they pray to the gods, and they ask, uh, please uh, send uh, something to get this Gilgamesh guy off our back. You know, he is uh, he is uh, wasting the men and raping all the women. Uh, but uh, yes, uh, this Enkidu uh, is sent, this uh, half-man, half-monster thing, and uh, they become best friends, and they go on adventure, this Gilgamesh and Enkidu. But uh, yes, uh, later on in the story, uh, Gilgamesh, he becomes afraid of uh, his death, his mortality, and he visits the sage Utnapishtim, Utnapishtim, the survivor, this, this uh, sage, he was survivor of the Great Flood. Uh, this is a very interesting point, by the way, the Great Flood. Uh, this features in many mythology, which suggests that the Great Flood was not just a uh, uh, a concept dreamt up in the Bible. It is actually in many different creation myths. I think three or four all over the globe. Uh, but uh, yes, uh, so uh, Gilgamesh, he, he visits the sage uh, Utnapishtim, uh, the survivor of the Great Flood, and hoping to find the morality. Um, and uh, Utnapishtim uh, directs him to go to uh, uh, the land, I believe, was called Dilman. And uh, this place... He's, he has to go through uh, some, some uh, numerous ordeals. He must uh, get on this boat, if I recall, and uh, go through this uh, dangerous land of reeds. And after this, he has to uh, talk with, uh, I think, Adam and Eve or, or someone similar uh, who survived the flood or something like this. And they tell him he needs to go. Uh, so he needs to first uh, stay awake for one week, which he fails to do. Um, and uh, so he fails to this one, and um, okay, so he walks away. Uh, but uh, they say, no, no, don't, don't, don't go. We still have one more thing to offer you. Uh, if you just swim down here, if you swim down to the bottom of this lake, you will uh, find the plant of immortality. So uh, he goes and swims down to the bottom of this uh, lake, and uh, he finds this plant, and he comes back up to the surface, and he's, you know, he's very happy with himself because he has found the uh, potion of immortality. So uh, he says, uh, thank you very much to the uh, to the pair. Uh, that survived the flood, I think, and uh, he leaves. And uh, as he's going back to uh, Babylon from Dilmun, which I th I think they say it is somewhere uh, 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 on the eastern side of the the Arabian Peninsula, maybe um, like a Bahrain, because the climate in Bahrain used to be very different um, three or four thousand years ago. By the way, it was much wetter. Uh, same with uh, the Arabian Peninsula; it actually had trees on it instead of sand. But uh, Yes, yeah, so uh, he, he is uh, traveling back to Babylon and he sleeps at this uh, oasis in the desert one night and as he is sleeping, a snake uh, slithers up and uh, steals the, the, the flower, I think, that has the immortality and uh, slithers off, uh, which I think is very interesting. Again, it is the fall of man, so to speak, uh, his loss of immortality by, by uh, the, the actions of the snake which seems to be a common theme as well in the Bible and a few other creation myths. But uh, yes, uh, uh, that is the answer uh, to your comment there. So uh, for Jungle German and uh, Dushmaster, uh, yes, uh, I see you, you know a, a great deal about this uh, yourself. Uh, it's a very interesting point you raise about migration of ancient peoples. 
the, the problem I find with investigating these peoples, you know, beyond, say, uh, 1 or 2000 BC, uh, is, is the lack of uh, writing language. You know, nomadic peoples, there is no civilization. There is, uh, it's, it's, you can't find any of their remnants if, if they did read anything at all. Uh, normally, the best you will find is cave paintings um, of these very early peoples. Uh, we can uh, we can speculate from legends and uh, languages, I think, um, and place names a little bit. This is what they do in Europe uh, to to kind of guess who was there first. I think there is a few places in England even now that have uh, still have ancient Celtic names from maybe ten thousand years ago or more. Um, but uh, yeah, I, like I said, uh, you know very much. Uh, I'm impressed. Um, me myself, I'm still learning. There's still much to read. Um, if I find out more about the subject, actual tangible text, I will try to make a video. Uh, I'm not yet at the point of um, um, intellectual prowess to make a, a speculative videos such as this. Um, uh, yes, uh, but I think speculative video may be on Japanese origin. You know, these uh, Ainu uh, Joman people uh, and Shinto, etc. would be a good idea. But uh, yes, I think that is all for now, my friends. This video has gotten very long and, and I am very tired. So, uh, and it is Saturday and I'm going to go um, and do something else. Uh, very good. Uh, have a good night. Bye.